there's a lot of interesting stuff on uh, on uh, popular practices. The uh, I think uh, you know the involvement of women in this might be a little surprising to some of you because they're really in the thick of it. And uh, it's to be noted that whereas in formal Islam or the seen face, uh, women are really not allowed or not permitted. They're not part of it so much. They don't go to the mosque uh, oftentimes because they're not really, it's not that they're forbidden to go, but they're not really, uh, it's not really necessary for them to bear. They don't feel part of it. But in uh, the seen face of Islam, they're not there, but in this stuff, popular Islam, women have come and have come, uh, they've really, they've really taken on some of a leadership role in many ways. They're right in the middle of it. They've involved in it and they can be practitioners as well. Uh, we're going to talk about the presence and the prominence and the power of peers. We're going to talk uh, something about the different kinds of amulets as well. Uh, and, and how they are used and what they are. So the, uh, the important thing is that there are felt needs in among Muslims. And so um, uh, you have to, to live with the spirits. Some are good, some are bad. These jinn uh, are not all bad, but you have to live with them and you have to protect yourself. At times you take advantage of them, use them, but there was also amount of, a certain amount of fear that you <clears throat> need to pacify them. There is the felt need for guidance, for solace, for comfort. Can't you, uh, can't you just see Jesus as he would walk among folk Muslims? Remember that he looked on the crowds and he was moved with compassion. Why? because they were like sheep without a shepherd. This is very true of Muslims in the world who have little hope, in fact, almost no hope in this world or in the world to come. They're the poorest of the poor. They have nowhere to go. And, uh, and so they're looking for some kind of guidance and help. And uh, the tragedy is that oftentimes they don't have anybody. They need to know the Good Shepherd. Jesus said, I am the Good Shepherd who gives my life, give my life for the sheep. So there is, there is, uh, uh, there is psychological and physical and spiritual help that is needed. Why? Because of uh, divorce, because of abuse, because of uh, ill treatment. And the question is, what kind of help do they get at the shrine? Uh, is it for real or is it uh, bogus? Well, that's a big question. In other words, we, we don't really know how much of it is real, but we do know that Satan is a cruel taskmaster. We do know that he uses deceit. We do know that he uh, blinds people, but we do know that he doesn't love them, and neither do his followers. The, the, the truth is that, uh, as I've mentioned, that God is really the one who needs to, to reach them. Only he can do it, and only the Good Shepherd can do it. Here are the felt needs in folk Islam, uh, the animistic answers to felt needs, and then the Christian answers. Notice that this is, um, <clears throat> this is, uh, is somewhat of a, well, um, there is a, a, a realm here or a range of possibilities. There is the fear of unknown, uh, which is also always, you know, always very you know, common. What, what, what will happen? What will happen to my child? And will my daughter get married? And so on. And <clears throat> what's going to happen? There is the, uh, the idolatry here, which is really an extreme and stone worship, but uh, somewhat more acceptable are the fetishes, the talismans, the charms, and definitely very, very common is the superstition. You can find this superstition. You do this to protect yourself from such and such. You do this, and there are lots of superstitions. 
we know that Christ is our keeper, our guide, and there is security in him. There is fear of evil. Here, this sorcery and witchcraft is somewhat on the margins. More acceptable and common are the amulets, the knots. When people go, Muslims go to the shrine, they will make a request or two or three or four, and they will tie a knot for each one. They'll leave a bit of their garment there, a bit of her cloth there, and uh, knots are represent a request. Exorcism, that's done as well. And uh, <clears throat> in Christianity, of course, we have exorcism, we have protection in Christ, uh, we, near not, we need not fear the devil uh, because of the protection around us. Christ has had victory over Satan, and uh, in Jesus' name, we can bid him flee, to take off. We don't, we're not afraid of him uh, through Christ. Fear of the future, angel worship is uh, an extreme. In other words, there aren't too many Muslims who are into, into this uh, to such a degree. But more common is divination, finding out uh, what should I do, and they use the Quran. To, uh, for div divination. They use other things and they go to people and you can hear, see them all over the world, but the Muslim world, you can see them sitting all over the place. Spells, fatalism, fanaticism is uh, also common. Trusting in Christ alone is the future, is Lord of the future. Here, the sh uh, felt need is shame of not being in the group. Here, magic or curses or blessings, this is done. Uh, hair nail trimmings. You don't trim your nails at night, and if you do, you certainly don't uh, leave them out somewhere for somebody else to take them and put a curse against you. Uh, you burn them or get rid of them, and that goes for your hair. Uh, that's right, too, as, as mentioned hair. Here there's uh, acceptance in the fellowship of believers. We are one body, and we do accept one another. Sometimes the community of Christ, you don't see it in some churches, there's things, something's missing as far as the community is. But, but certainly if we understood the body of Christ, and if the body of Christ is what it should be, there is this warm fellowship uh, of believers. Here, the felt need is powerlessness of the individual against evil. You just, you're a victim. It's going to happen. It will happen. You can't do anything about it. Uh, saint worship, well, it, that's really what it is. People worshiping the saints, though they might not call it that. Uh, really, what that's what it amounts to. The baraka is the blessing, uh, and going to the saint for you know with a petition. Here we have the Holy Spirit, uh, who is the power and power source of our lives, through whom we can gain the victory. Meaningless of life. Uh, they do have the, uh, quite a bit to do with familiar spirits, because when you're born in the physical world, at the same time, your counterpart, often of the opposite sex, is born in the spirit world, uh, a jinn, and this is called a krina. This is an intimate spirit. And here we have our purpose in life as God's child, how much he loves us, we must uh, discover and, and think about it and, and realize it. Sickness, the fear, uh, here you have saint worship, or, or at least trying to get away, you know, get over it and get help from sickness, uh, healing and magic. And we do have divine healing, but we also have uh, in the Bible grace to suffer. Uh, this, the theology of suffering must not be uh, bypassed. The, uh, the female patrons among the for the shrines is very very notable and i think the reason for it is that women feel powerless they feel powerless and they are a non-essential in formal worship public worship uh, there is the um, the saying in pakistan that a woman is like a pair of shoes once the shoes wear out you can just as easily get another pair so women resort to folk practices a book I have had my students read sometimes for the uh, Islam, the spiritual world of Islam, or the spirit world of Islam, is a book written by Janice Bodhi, an anthropologist from the University of Toronto, 
Wolves and Alien Spirits. It's a difficult book to get through, but it talks about uh, the Zara cult <coughs> in the Sudan and along the Nile River, and um, it's quite a book, really. It's quite revealing. Another one is Women and Demons, Cult Healing in Islamic Egypt, and there are uh, all kinds of sources. Uh, here's another Discourse of Resistance Spirit Possession Among the Women in Low-Income Cairo, <clears throat> the uh, Tsar visit or a possession cult is uh, is a, a cult that seeks to manipulate a spirit uh, among women in Egypt, in the Sudan, and they get together and have their their parties uh, where there is a possession uh, and they uh, minister somehow the woman has a need and she is... Uh, is appeals to the spirit, the czar, uh, and uh, whether it's for um, fertility or something like that, uh, something like that. But but there is this this uh, this cult, and and once women get into it, they can't get out of it. They have to keep going back and back and back and back. The ceremony is there. Uh, there is a sacrifice. There is music, and interestingly enough, though it is for women, there are men playing the music. Uh, women get into a trance. There is a frenzied dance. Sometimes uh, spinsters who are old and stiff and decrepit can dance like crazy. There is exhaustion. There is some kind of a therapy. In other words, women come here and they get a feeling of, well, a feeling of oneness, a feeling of, uh, of, of, of being ministered to. Uh, yes, uh, we don't know all the troubles that women come for, but it might be uh, through a, a cruel husband or a, a, some kind of thing, but uh, it's quite a thing that uh, we really can't get into. But you can go on the net and just look under Zar, Z-A-R, and find all kinds of things, including pictures of the practitioners, the woman, women who, who run them, and uh, it's, uh, it's quite a thing. Now let's talk a little bit more about the female patrons. Women seem to be the best patrons. Why do they come? Well, they come for many things. You know, women have to have sons. You get married, you have to have a son. Or you have to somehow uh, live with a, with a mean mother-in-law. And oftentimes, the mother-in-law is possessive of, possessive of her son. There is this mother-son relationship. And mothers can be possessive of their sons. They don't want to lose their affection. And so they hang on to the son uh, and in the sense, and, and then the, um, the marriage relationship between the son and his wife are, is jeopardized, all because of uh, the sinful selfishness of the mother-in-law who wants to hold her son's affections. There is the uh, need for deliverance from the jinn, and sometimes these girls, uh, for instance, if uh, the father decides it's time for them to get married, uh, they think they're too young and they don't want to marry the old guy, so they fake uh, being possessed by a jinn. Uh, that's maybe sometimes the only resource they have. But uh, even though women are the best patrons, sometimes men go to, quite often, they go for various reasons. They go for financial security. They go to avoid accidents because there's no, uh, uh, there's no insurance, auto insurance. They might go for healing. They might go for confession, one thing or another. And it's not that they are either people of the shrine or people of the, of the mosque, no. They'll go to the shrine on Thursday and to the mosque on Friday. So it's both and. I can uh, uh, think of a Pakistani woman who couldn't have a son. She wanted to have a, a, a baby boy, but she couldn't, she couldn't, she couldn't. And finally, uh, she went to the pier about, oh, I don't know, 30 miles away where we lived. And the next year, she had a baby boy. What do you think she called him? Pir Bakhsh, meaning uh, Pir is the saint. Uh, and he was given, the baby was given by the, by the Pir. Somehow the Pir, uh, you know, made a, a request or something. And she wore a little amulet around her wrist or something. And she had a baby boy. Uh, these are Tawizes. Now, the Tawiz is a, an amulet with a special verse out of the Quran. 
and they use various uh, verses. Uh, the favorite is one of the favorites is, of course, Sura number one, which is the Fatiha. That's a favorite, but others too. Favorite passages, just like uh, Psalm 23 to us, they'll pick a passage and a verses out of the Quran, and these are written on special paper, folded into a little leather pouch, and hung somewhere on the body as a amulet. Another one that's very good uh, is the, um, the Ayatul Hifaz, which is uh, the verses of protection. Five verses, and this comes out of the uh, Quran 2 and 255. It's the, um, the throne verse. Allah, there is no God but he. The living, the self-subsisting, eternal. No slumber can seize him nor sleep. Who is there that can intercede in his presence except as he permits? And on and on. And then his throne, it says, doth extend over the heavens. Uh, these are the verses of protection. Another one that's uh, pretty good is 15 and verse 17. 15 and 17. Moreover, we have guarded them, listen to this, from every evil spirit accursed see so here the quran is used as a magical power against the uh, against evil spirits or 37 37 and verse 7 for beauty and for guard against all obstinate rebellious spirits see how the spirit world is right in the Quran. You might think that all of this is uh, from outside, but it's really part and parcel of the Quran. In other words, the Quran uh, was born in this kind of a context. Here's a famous amulet, a Quran amulet uh, that is used against the evil eye in the center. Right here in the center is a verse from the Quran. And that's uh, 68, 51 through 52. Uh, Surah 68, 51 through 52. And this and the verse says, And the unbelievers would almost trip thee up with their eyes when they hear the message and they say, Surely he is possessed. Well, what is this? This is the idea that you can put the evil eye on somebody, the eye of envy, and trip them up. So you have to protect yourself from uh, from harm and danger from the evil eye. The evil eye is very, very dangerous. And uh, here is the verse that we're going to go to next. 2 and 256. We looked at this before. Um, I think really what they mean is 255. The throne verse, which is... Uh, 2 and 255, his throne doth extend over the heavens. That is in the margins, uh, here along the all the margins, the throne verse. And then uh, at the end you have Quran 112, 113, and 114, and these are the famous chapters that are used against, uh, you know, to protect against evil spirits and uh, what Muhammad himself uh, reve was revealed to him when he had a curse put on him. So that's the famous amulet uh, that is used. Now, here are common amulets in Turkey. Look at the uh, horseshoe and the horse. Horse is a good animal. Some animals are not good, but the horse is a uh, an animal of protection. And then you have in here the uh, little places here which are the evil eye. In other words, the uh, protect you from the evil eye. Uh, let's look at these here. These are charms. Utensils and mother of pearl fish to please the jinn. Um, different kinds here. We no use spending a whole lot of time talking about them, but there are different kinds of protective charms to somehow keep uh, you know, the, the jinn, this is what spirits, to keep them happy and to uh, keep disease and danger away. Charms are used. Various uh, types of stones 
And here is one that uh, says God on it. God. This is very common, you know, to use this, the, use the name of God uh, or, and his 99 names of God. Though Muslims claim to, uh, you know, to believe in God and, and so on, monotheistic religion, yet this is where the power is, right here, through amulets. And they use God's name in various ways and means. This one here is a, a Quranic amulet sold, picked up in Shanghai, in mosques used to defend against the jinn and other evils to produce good health and fortune. See, uh, verses from the Quran. Here is the first anim the amulet found on the left-hand arm of a Turkish officer during a fight with the Arabs over the Suez Canal. And the second one, I guess, was found in the Shat al-Arab, the Tigris and Euphrates River, where they, they meet. Uh, this was found on, a, presumably, a dead soldier, a Turkish soldier. This one is uh, the names of God. Remember, said before just a minute ago, this comes right out of Zwemer's book. Um, and the names of God, the 99 names of God are used as amulets. This one here, these here are used to protect against the evil eye. Uh, sometimes they will take the, uh, the eye of a sheep sl uh, slaughtered in Mecca or, uh, and, and the uh, evil Adha, the great feast, and they'll take that eye out of the sheep and they'll make uh, an amulet out of it, and it's, uh, it's a protection against the evil eye. 